Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media, I'm Grant Abbott and today we're looking at these lovely treasure chests here. This is all part of the game Atlas Empires which I'm working on at the moment. And there's links in the description to playlists of me creating other assets, also hand painting techniques and a website with details about the game. And I was told recently that the game is due to be released around February so quite excited about that. Also, if you have any questions, then do let me know in the comments below and I'll try and include those into other videos or I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. So this time I didn't have particularly clear uh, reference images. I think Chris has got very busy with other things. He did give me some concept art, which was great and uh, gave me a guide about roughly what he wanted. Uh, but he said he wanted me to just sort of just go for it with uh, these particular models and see what I could come up with. So hopefully he's quite pleased. I've actually seen the models uh, in the sort of test game and I'm very excited about them. So very pleased with how they've turned out. So you can see I started off with the basic cube and then sort of built up from there. It's a funny one really, I wasn't sure of the best way to tackle it and often you just have to start modeling and try a few things out and see what works. And I actually split up the model later on uh, into different sections and into different parts. Uh, so the wooden bits I separate and uh, separate some of the metal bits as well. It is supposed to look like metal, it's quite tough to paint metal uh, and it's looking a bit more stony than metal but it seems to come out quite well in the game so quite happy. Obviously these are uh, far more detailed than they w need to be in many ways so lots of those minor inaccuracies don't really come across because uh, they'll be seen quite small on a mobile screen. So occasionally I feel like I'm possibly over modeling a little bit but I'd rather go that way than the other way where I'm sort of underdoing it and they're not looking good. So uh, that's the main thing really, that they look good in the final uh, game. You can see here that I've gone probably a little bit detailed in the polygon count as well uh, with the sort of top and the bottom of the base. Uh, so that sort of lid uh, and it's got a little lid lip in there for the lid. And then I merge the vertices and take it away later on. So wherever I can paint in that detail, I will, but you would see it in the silhouette. And I always talk about the silhouette. So looking around your model, seeing it from different angles, do you need uh, more detail when you see it from certain aspects and angles? And that's looking around all the time at the silhouette and making sure it works. Uh, you can see I'm cutting up the model a bit here now. Uh, so obviously I don't need the inside faces. Uh, getting rid of those at this stage is a good idea. Um, then it won't be duplicated across into the other models as well. And you have to sort of, um, I use link duplicates, so uh, when it's duplicated, it should update all the other ones when you change one. Uh, but occasionally I sort of have to uh, take off the link uh, because I want it to be an individual model because they will share the UVs as well. I think I probably sound a bit like a broken record saying these things over and over again. So now I'm onto the big padlock at the front. Uh, that was kind of fun for some reason. Uh, I don't know, it's those sort of chunky metal things that are, it's quite easy to model I suppose as well. Uh, you can see that I'm pausing every now and again because I do take time to uh, look at uh, new reference images uh, online and try and gather loads. My uh, pure ref is getting absolutely massive as well. It's just got loads and loads of images on there uh, to try and help me uh, figure out ideas and uh, reference images are just so vital with this sort of work, and well for me anyway, uh, to get different ideas and uh, try and uh, create uh, new interesting looks and uh, base it on old stuff that you've already seen as well. Uh, yeah, it helps tremendously. So the second model here, the second chest, I've duplicated the bottom, so that's a link duplicate. So when I paint the first one, it will paint the second one as well, but obviously the top is very different, so I've separated that out so that I can texture that um, separately. Now you can see here I'm using the proportional edit option and the proportional edit has uh, lots of options within it but I always just tend to use the default and just uh, pull it around and then push it back into place. Uh, I'm kind of, I suppose, am I lazy in that sense? I just sort of uh, use a tool in its basic settings and then adapt it as I see fit but um, other people are, are much more intricate with the way they model. So they'll be good at things like modifiers and using all the right techniques to make things, whereas I'm just uh, quickly get it done uh, haphazardly. Uh, but it works out in the end, and that's always the way, I think. Uh, there's loads of techniques to modeling, uh, but if it looks good in the end, and if it works structurally in the end as well, uh, so it's got the right poly count and things like that, and you can paint on it, then it doesn't really matter how you got there, in my opinion. Obviously, if it takes absolutely ages, then that does matter, but in terms of uh, getting the final result uh, quick and easily then 
uh, just, just get it done. And there's loads of techniques to getting these things done as well. I've seen a few videos uh, online about the, the only way you should be modeling is this way and so forth. But it really, if you get results from your modeling and you can do it within the time frame given, uh, then it's a good way of modeling basically. I actually saw a video from Flip Normals uh, and they were talking about how you shouldn't be modeling with subdivision surface modifier on. And I could see their point completely, but um, I kind of disagree to a sense uh, that uh, if it looks good in the end and you can adapt your model accordingly with all those constraints, then it doesn't really matter. But I can see the point that it's actually better and easier to model without the subdivision surface modifier on, uh, which makes a lot of sense. And I certainly have a lot of respect for their channel. It's absolutely fantastic. But at the end of it all, it's the results that count and what it looks like. So I'm onto the third chest here. It's very simplistic modeling, really. Uh, it's very basic and uh, trying to uh, just duplicate shapes where I need to and then adapt them slightly. Obviously, I can't do link duplicates if you adapt the shape because that would adapt the first one. So uh, that's, a, that's a shift D rather than an alt D. Uh, so I can actually adapt that shape and it will have new UVs and so on. I did do a live stream the other day and uh, that was quite fun and so I'm testing those sort of things out so I might do some things uh, live stream. Uh, I don't know how much of it I'm going to do, I'll just sort of try these things out, have a bit of fun. Um, I, I'm very sort of community based so when uh, I can get people involved I do like doing that and it's great fun so uh, uh, look out for some live streams later on. I don't know whether I'll live stream any Atlas Empire stuff, but maybe I will. Uh, maybe if I get to play the game, uh, I'll live stream that. That'd be quite fun. Uh, you can see that uh, a lot of the time I'm just um, adding things in, uh, sort of almost haphazard in a sense, so just extruding faces, joining them up. Bridge edge loops is important for that sort of thing. So uh, very simplistic type of modeling, very basic. Uh, and quite quick really. Uh, that's the main thing with a lot of this work. So with this sort of cylindrical chest, um, I started modeling it and then I thought actually uh, this would probably be best if it was mirrored and I mirror this uh, twice so across the X and Y axis. But obviously you have to turn it slightly so the feet um, are mirrored correctly. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so you have to think about that when you're setting up your cylinder to start with. I think there are plugins, uh, well add-ons sorry, that you can get uh, where you can adapt your cylinder after uh, you've edited it uh, but generally speaking you can't and I have loads of beginners saying I can't get back that screen where I can change the size of my cylinder or the cuts of my cylinder yes as soon as you edit it uh, you can't change it but I, like I say I think there is an add-on uh, for that somewhere where you can go back but uh, you have to think carefully that your cylinder is divisible by four if you want to mirror it in the X and Y and often with cylindrical shapes I'm doing that to save on the UV space uh, so mirroring is uh, really uh, common and important uh, when you're doing low poly hand painted models uh, because of the texture space that you're using and try and keep it really low. On the last one here, this was a bit of fun because I had to create a sort of um, crystal type shape. So I just sort of cut some randomness into it with the knife tool. And I like the knife tool. It does create end gons, so you have to be a bit careful and you have to sort of understand a little bit about n-gons and how they'll be triangulated in the end so all get all n-gons are triangulated that's really important to know uh, but once you know those sort of things and you know how it's going to work when it is tri triangulated uh, then using the knife tool is absolutely fine and it's a really useful thing to do so here i'm creating some simple diamond shapes uh, when i overlap the edges that you can see there i try not to overlap them too much but they do need to be inserted into the object so they have to have some sort of overlap um, otherwise you're going to see the seams and you're going to see the background so you do have to watch out for that. So here's the unwrap process. I've gone through a bit more detail about the unwrap process uh, in other videos so hopefully that all made sense but if you have any questions then do ask and I'll again try and get back to you on these things. Uh, I would strongly recommend not using the basic unwrap that Blender does automatically because when you unwrap lots of things together it doesn't seem to like that unwrap a lot so uh, do your own unwraps uh, don't rely on blender's sort of default unwrap where possible creating simple shapes simple sort of rectangles as far as you can uh, just keeping everything uh, very uh, basic i keep going on about how basic things need to be uh, but anything uh, that are circles uh, in your maps you've kind of got to watch out for a bit and try and make them into more rectangular stuff 
and anything that looks squashed there's probably an error there so uh, go through uh, cut it up a little bit more and just uh, make sure that everything's nicely mapped out in 2D. You can see here that I've gone back to the modeling uh, for a second because I noticed that one wasn't mirrored and it just didn't make sense not to be mirrored uh, especially as there was a sort of cut down the middle I could save a bit of texture space so um, the unwrapping process is quite good for going around and checking your uh, model with a sort of fine tooth comb as it were uh, and really getting the detail that you need. So I think that's almost all the unwrapping done, yep, and then I sort of uh, select everything, uh, go into edit mode, unwrap together and just have a quick look around, make sure everything's the right size as it should be. And I think I made a mistake on this map, which was very frustrating. I didn't use the average island scale, so one of them must have been out slightly and the diamond ended up using, the really tiny diamond on the last um, chest, ended up using a lot of texture space and that was quite frustrating. But it's really, really awkward to go back once that's all done because you have to get all your objects, rebake them uh, and that would, it would take uh, probably a few hours to uh, sort out a problem like that. It's not a massive problem either, it's just uh, a disproportionate amount of texture space on one object. Uh, which it, in the long run it doesn't make a huge amount of difference uh, but it's just frustrating to have that happen. So as always the same process for texture painting so I've set up my texture paint here uh, using uh, the principal shader to start off with to get the shape uh, so I can see the edges see the, um, the sharp edges and then I can draw those sharp edges in and then using the emission shader uh, with the node wrangler add-on so I can just press uh, control shift uh, left click uh, and then I can quick, quickly go between the two and get uh, sort of hard shading and soft shading as it were. But the soft shading is what you always end up with. So your model should always be um, with uh, smooth shading, I should say, not soft shading. Uh, should, they, should, but they should always be shade smooth rather than flat. Uh, and people were asking me about should you export with uh, mark sharp and all this sort of thing. If you really want a sharp edge then yes but generally that should be painted on if you're hand painting your textures. So all the detail of any sharp edges, uh, that's all painted on with your highlights, as you can see that I've done on the top um, of this particular chest. So the usual process is to fill in with a base color, uh, then add some randomness to the color. Uh, more randomness if you've got a shiny object because that's reflecting the environment around it, so you get a bit more randomness in the light and the color. Uh, and then you go in and do your details. So uh, you can see that I've done my edges and then I go around with the multiply brush. The edges I do with the screen brush, generally speaking, and then uh, the darker bits with the multiply brush. I still like using the screen and multiply brush. Uh, it's a bit strange because when I'm in Photoshop, I tend to use uh, just use the Alt key and sample colors all, uh, from around the object. But in Blender, I like using the screen brush and multiply brush, uh, maybe because of the, uh, the way I'm just used to texturing. It just seems to work for me uh, to give it that shading and things. Uh, but in Photoshop, I suppose you add a new layer and you use the, the, the blend modes and so forth and the dodge and burn brush as they're called. Uh, but in Blender, it's slightly different with the uh, screen and multiply brushes. So painting wood, uh, again, I've got all these uh, in detail. So painting wood uh, and painting rocks. I haven't done one for painting metal actually. Maybe I need to do that in more detail. So I'll try and find a section where I'm painting some metal. Um, I don't, I still don't feel like I'm that great at metal. It's coming out okay and it looks quite nice in the game, but I feel like there's a lot to be learned uh, when painting metal. It's very tough to paint those reflections uh, and get them looking right. Um, obviously reflections don't work when they're baked, if that makes sense. Uh, so uh, they should adapt when you're moving around your objects and light should glint off it. And that's not going to happen with your hand painted textures uh, unless you've got a hand painted roughness map in there as well, which obviously this doesn't. Uh, so you've really got to fake everything and that's, it's just very, very tough with uh, metal. It's, a, it's very satisfying once you uh, get a bit of it right, uh, but um, it's frustrating and time consuming when you're, uh, when you're struggling with it. And this, this was a very time consuming uh, set of models, this one, probably because of all the metal in there. And like I said, I still didn't have it quite right. It's, it's good, I'm happy with it, uh, but it's, it's not where I want it to be and there's still more work to be done uh, and practice to be made. What will make it tougher is using a mirror uh, because you can't add that character element. So if you've got a sort of a glint or a shine or a sheen on something, it will all look a bit weird when it's mirrored. So you have to kind of uh, do your best to avoid that. Um, so it makes it even tougher to get those 
um, sort of elements that make it sort of seem shiny. Um, I think maybe I went a bit too big with my highlights on this one and they needed to be a bit thinner. Uh, it's, it's very tough. I, I keep watching more tutorials to, to learn how to do this, looking at lots of references uh, to try and get it right uh, and try and make it work. It is just about working. Uh, I'm uh, comfortable that it's working, but it's not as good as it, I've seen other artists. That's the thing, isn't it? You're always comparing yourself. And uh, there's some fantastic work out there and you think, how do you get that look? I want to be able to do that. <laughs> so I'll get there eventually. Uh, but at the moment, uh, still, still working towards it. You can see I'm trying to make the top uh, nice and shiny, uh, so I've made it a lot brighter, but then it just looks really a sort of brushed metal uh, and it didn't quite work, so I sort of took that away. But again, every time I'm doing, some, I'm doing one of these models or painting something, I try something new, see if it works. If it doesn't work, then I'll just press undo, of course, and uh, adapt and try and learn from my mistakes. Uh, I think it's very important to not just do the same things over and over again. Uh, but uh, just uh, adapt and try something new, uh, experiment a little bit. Even on production work like this, uh, I think it's still important for me to be experimenting with new techniques uh, and try things out. This whole thing is uh, sped up to 10 times, so it's a thousand percent. So it, you can get an idea of how long this is uh, taking me, a particularly long one this time. But it's still great fun, I'm still really enjoying it all and having lots of fun. Oh, now this is interesting because um, I noticed that the mirror was up and down and you can't do that uh, with uh, an object that's vertical, if that makes sense. So it's mirrored in the z-axis in this scenario. Um, and you need the top bit to be lighter than the bottom bit. So I can mirror it across, so in the x-axis in this case, but I can't mirror it in the z-axis because uh, the highlight that I'm gonna put at the top uh, will appear at the bottom. Uh, but obviously it's alright if it appears on the other side and that's fine. And actually the, it's tough when painting on a mirror, it, it can be a bit awkward and you have to use the smear brush a bit because uh, it, when you're painting it sort of goes across the other side. And sometimes you're better off turning off the mirror when you're painting and just painting on that one side. But then it can be a bit confusing as well. But you can see there the dark, uh, the bottom is much darker than the top and that wouldn't have worked with a mirror. But this one's fine because it's got a mirror going across in the x-axis. Hopefully that makes sense. There's a bit of a double highlight there, which doesn't really quite make sense. Uh, you shouldn't really do that, but it sort of works out and roughly uh, makes sense with the way the lock's positioned and things. Uh, obviously things can have two highlights because you can imagine there's gonna be two uh, lights in the scene. Uh, maybe there's um, you know, a sun and a lamp or something like that. But generally speaking, when you're thinking of this sort of model, you usually have uh, the sun coming from above and that's about it really. You can see here I'm just painting a tiny bit of uh, interest on the lock, uh, something that's nice and simple, so it had a sort of ridge uh, to the middle of the lock. I thought that made it uh, look more interesting, basically. And later on I think I paint that a sort of brassy colour, um, although it started off as gold and then ended up being brass because uh, it, it was too orangey. Uh, but still, it seems to work and it's uh, working out nicely, I think. Uh, again, if I'm mirroring, I've got to be careful of those uh, swirly details that I put on the wood, make sure they aren't uh, mirrored across uh, the middle, and you see that repetition. When you can see the mirror, it's very difficult to add those sort of details. So yes, this was supposed to be a bit sort of gold, and then I thought actually a brass lock for the, the first level will make more sense, so I was quite happy keeping it that sort of brassy colour. It's got a sort of goldy look, I suppose, but um, gold is a bit more... Um, yellow than brass, I suppose. They're quite close really, to be honest. Again, I'm using the uh, blend mode uh, brush with the fill brush, use the, the color blend mode, and it works really nicely uh, to just change the colors around really easily and quickly. It's nice and simple. Of course, you can, again, you can only do that uh, if your models are separate. Uh, if, um, or I suppose you could highlight uh, faces that you want to change the color of. You could do it that way, but it's quite awkward when all your models join together. And so it is uh, a little bit nicer sometimes painting uh, your models separately. But then you do have to uh, squ switch between all your um, models all the time. So you're going into object mode, back into texture paint mode. You don't have to do it that way, but I do find it a bit easier. You can uh, turn, um, it's under the editing preferences, lock object mode. And then you can just alt left click on an object to sort of select the new one 
and it will go into the mode that it was originally in. So in this case, if it was in texture paint mode, then you uh, just switch and you're still on texture paint mode. Uh, and so you can switch between the two easily with that setting. But it's actually a little bit awkward, unfortunately. I think the main reason that it's awkward is actually because I haven't labeled my objects correctly. So it gives you an option if uh, there's an ob object in the background. Uh, so when you left, alt left click, uh, it, it lists all the options that are sort of underneath your mouse, as it were. But uh, unfortunately, because mine are all cube one and cube two, <laughs> and I haven't labeled them properly, uh, just for those time reasons, uh, then uh, it's, it's a little bit awkward. I suppose that's one of those debates, isn't it? How you should be labeling your work and so forth. Uh, but I tend to just sort of rush through. I label my collections, and that's really important to me because the collections are uh, vital to the way I organize my project. Uh, but uh, the actual models themselves are all cube one, cube two, <laughs> cube three, so forth. I think curved surfaces are far more easier to paint. As you can see, the, the curve of this treasure chest top uh, looks a lot like metal. So it's that sort of sheen that you get on curved surfaces, whereas uh, flat metal surfaces are a bit tougher because uh, you need to sort of have uh, just a flat a version of light color and a dark color down the side. It's tricky to describe, but um, you can kind of see that the top of this treasure chest looks okay uh, in the long run, but uh, the first one doesn't look as good, unfortunately. I think maybe what I need to do is to do a detailed tutorial about painting metal and uh, paint a curved surface so we can sort of work on that together, perhaps. Um, maybe something completely different from a treasure chest. Maybe something, a piece of armor or something like that would be quite fun. Now uh, let me know in the comments below uh, what you'd like to see, if you're still with me after, what are we, 20 minutes in? Uh, it's, uh, again, it's nice to hear those comments from people saying, I'm still with you, Grant, it's lovely to hear. I uh, only get a few, so obviously only a few people get it this far. Uh, and I, I can understand that. Uh, it, it's nice to just sort of get a rough idea, isn't it, and see what's going on, and then move on to the next video usually. Uh, it's, they're quite long, these videos. I try and keep them long, though, because I think uh, people appreciate um, the, the whole process, so I understand if you do, and I'm trying to uh, keep it in there for you guys. So you can see that I'm trying to paint this one a goldy color. Um, I've probably gone a bit too dark, and I think the highlights could have uh, gone a bit further. In the end, I thought I need to uh, move on to the next model, because this was uh, very time consuming, these models, and um, although um, I want to get the perfect result in the end, I know that these are quite small models uh, on the screen, so really you're not going to see those tiny minute changes but but I think I should have gone a bit um, harder with the highlights I mean brighter when I say harder um, and maybe change the color slightly to a more yellowy color uh, after looking at other people's work uh, with uh, the way they paint gold uh, again looking at loads of tutorials still learning a lot about these things I think also perhaps the, the top of this chest is quite um, quite big uh, a big part of the model and maybe another loop cut in uh, the top of this chest would have helped. It looks a little bit too um, angular, doesn't it, rather than curved, unfortunately. Um, I Do I add one in later on? Actually, I can't remember now. <laughs> it's a, uh, yeah, maybe I did. Um, but you can add it in uh, when you're painting. So if I added a loop cut in here, you've just got to use the edge slide tool and it will slide the UVs as well as um, the um, the model itself. So if I just grab the model, it will stretch the UVs across it. But if I do the edge slide, it will slide along the UVs so you don't have to worry about your painting be being distorted when you add new loop cuts and things. You can see the way I'm painting here. I'm sort of painting sort of dark blobby bits that are um, meant to be sort of shadows for one, but also uh, different reflections. So it's, it's very blobby um, around the place, uh, sort of blotchy uh, the way I'm painting things on. But that is for a reason, in the sense that I want um, some sort of reflective quality and therefore you don't get a natural looking smooth surface uh, as you can sort of see. It's, it's just about working I think. So here I go quite sort of uh, yellowy and that seems to work, but I think later on I must dull it down a little bit more because um, it, it didn't seem quite enough, uh, the yellowiness, uh, but it, it, it's sort of working there. Um, but sometimes when you stare at something as well for too long, um, your eyes become adjusted to it and it's tough to know what the problems are. So you need to sort of step away from the model, like in a way what I'm doing here. So I have, I'm sort of revisiting this model after painting it. This is a very useful process for me talking about these models. 
um, but uh, step away from it for a few hours at least, a day if you can, and then go back to it and suddenly think, oh yeah, I need to sort that out and change that. In fact, it's, I feel like it's looking better than the final result here, uh, so maybe I went in and changed the colour a bit too much, um, but it looks a bit more goldy now with a bit of an orangey tint. Oh no, that's, uh, that is about right. I think maybe it turned out better than I thought. <laughs> But it looks okay. Uh, but again, it's because I'm staring at it for too long at the moment and talking about it. Uh, but maybe when I first saw it this morning, when I looked at this model and thought, eh, it could do with a bit of work. Uh, and uh, trust yourself on those initial instincts and don't trust your instincts once you've been staring at it for a while because your mind's very good at understanding shapes and inaccuracies and sort of working it out. It's sort of like when a child draws a face and it's, or a stick man even. We work out that it's a person, even though it looks nothing like a person, and our mind sort of adapts to it. So you can see I'm trying to change the colour a little bit here. It looked a bit too much like brass rather than gold, but this might be where I went a bit too far, um, possibly. Yeah, the base looks a bit too um, shiny at the moment. It's a tough one. It was it was tricky. Uh, gold, it's actually the first time I painted uh, gold. I think, well, no, not quite, but a big gold, a chunky gold thing like this anyway. Uh, I've painted gold before, but usually gold uh, pieces in pieces of armour or something like that, or ruins or whatever it might be. You can see me here going in and painting some of those shadows in, so there's a bit more uh, depth to it. It's quite important that, that you paint in the ambient occlusion, so you're painting it right in the crevices, making them look very dark. You could, if you weren't doing a modular approach, just uh, bake in the sort of ambient occlusion, so you can set your lights up. Uh, bake the textures and then paint over them so it's got all the lighting information in and I did that with the, um, the ruin uh, destroyed building um, model because there was less modular um, pieces to that and I could separate them all out um, but for this one it's still got modular pieces in so um, you can't you can't do baking on modular pieces because they'll um, they, they just won't work towards the light and things you can't bake on um, multiple objects like that, multiple linked objects anyway. Lots of people have asked more detailed uh, stuff about uh, baking. I can understand that it's really complicated and quite awkward. Um, I'm sort of shying away from videos about baking actually because I can imagine them just, uh, it, it's a tough one to explain basically, um, how it works and what you're doing. Uh, and <laughs> I was doing it recently and it was frustrating uh, because I kept uh, messing up. There's so many things you have to remember to do uh, and if they don't if you don't remember it will come up badly and so I know I'm going to get loads of comments saying my bake didn't work. Uh, it happens every time in the classroom uh, when I talk about baking uh, and I'm actually sort of steering clear of it now because it's such a pain uh, for students to understand they can give up quickly as well because it is a really awkward process. I don't know whether other programs are better. I imagine probably not because the setup has to be the same in any program really. Um, and if you get it wrong, uh, it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so it's very frustrating and, and there's so many things that can go wrong. Um, yeah, so, uh, but I will do uh, videos about baking. I'll just have to be prepared for all the comments that I'm gonna get about it not working for them. <laughs> so you can see me painting on this model. I painted the wood and uh, it's repeated. So it's uh, a mirrored object uh, down the X and Y axis. So you only have to paint on one quarter in this case, um, but uh, that does cause problems in terms of adding that character element, which can be frustrating. This is an interesting one again. Uh, I still don't feel like I've quite got the gold right. Uh, it looks a bit plasticky in places. Um, I try lots of different techniques with this, but and you can see I've done a very bright highlight on the top, but it's, it just looks a little bit plasticky. And I think that's because the reflections aren't coming through. And uh, metal seems to be more reflective, doesn't it, than uh, sort of plastic and so it, it's a really sort of shiny, smooth, plasticky chest at the moment. <laughs> a little bit frustrating. I didn't quite get that right. You can see I'm trying to adapt the earlier chest here, thinking, oh, it's not quite right. I'm going to go back to that, smarten it up a bit. And I think uh, that did help. Uh, it's got a bit more shininess to the top and going in, marking out those crevices and lines a bit more where objects meet. Um, so a bit more detail, basically. And I think that does look better now that I've done that. So I'm Pleased I went back in and did that, but it's still not quite there. There's still something about it that's not quite there. It's frustrating. Uh, and these chests, I really, really trying it. I feel like it looks like gold for a moment, but then suddenly you think, oh, but it, why is it so plasticky then? 
Yeah, it's a frustrating thing. It was it's a very good uh, learning curve for me, uh, trying to do these things. And metal, I think, is the hardest thing to hand paint. Uh, quite quite fun, quite challenging, but very time consuming. <laughs> so you can see there with these flat surfaces, I make one uh, surface quite uh, a lot brighter than the sides are a bit darker than the bottoms much darker and that should give the impression that the sun's coming from the top uh, but you can't make it too uniform so you have to act like it's got a few reflections and I think that's where I needed to be a bit more risky uh, give it some actual reflections so sort of blobby shapes in there as if something's being reflected uh, and you can see I'm doing that at the top and it actually works all right um, I put a few highlights in a few sort of blobs and then it looks like there's a reflection coming from it but I just wasn't um, courageous enough to go for those uh, shapes. Uh, but you can see them there, they, they look a bit like a reflection. And I, uh, I panicked a bit and thought, actually, that's not working. And I think I undid some of that work. <laughs> and that's, I suppose that's uh, what it's like, isn't it? Uh, you just find out what works, keep practicing, keep trying. Um, it's strange, really, because why can't we look at something and just be able to do it straight away and be able to mimic it? Uh, but it just seems to take so much time to. Uh, learn how to do these things properly. I think that's the major thing that puts people off 3D modeling and 3D, um, especially uh, texture painting, is the time it takes to learn these things. 3D modeling, I think, is a, a quicker um, thing to learn because you don't need artistic skill as such. But with texture painting, you need to earn, learn the and understand the technical sides as well as uh, be an artist. So it's, it, it's quite a process with the, the texture painting. And I imagine eventually hand-painted textures are all going to be done procedurally. Uh, they, they, I feel like they lose a bit of character when they're done like that, um, but you have to kind of prepare for the future and that the fact that uh, we might lose our jobs as texture artists is certainly a thing and it's important that you do have something else lined up uh, as something else that you're good at. That's why it's important not to completely specialise and be a generalist in everything and a specialist in one thing, in my opinion anyway. I think that's I think that's really vital, especially with the the rate of knots that AI is uh, improving, uh, especially in in our field. I have talked about this before, but I think the first uh, positions that are going to go are those that are doing realistic models, because uh, in a way, 3D scans and things like that are, are coming along really uh, quickly now. Uh, and so, if you're doing realistic models rather than stylized models, um, you're going to be in trouble quicker than the rest who are doing stylized models but the computers will take over there as well soon and that's why it's good to have a good understanding of game design in general uh, so you can become a games designer and just say to the computer I want a, a person here that has runs like this and it will do it for you and then you've uh, the games design understanding is important at that point so you can make games with people and generally having new ideas and new uh, ways of thinking uh, to make games fun. Uh, that's what you should also be thinking about if you're obviously in the games industry. I think visual effects as well, the same sort of uh, thing if you're doing things for movie or um, TV. Then work on aspects about getting new ideas and appealing to the target audience and things like that, uh, which is a little bit tougher for the um, computers to work out. <laughs> it won't be long though uh, before we're all out of a job. Anyway, back to the model. Uh, so we've got these diamondy bits here and uh, they're repeated around the shape. Oh, that's right, I had to um, rebake. Did I have to rebake? Yes, I did, because I accidentally drew on the old one. Uh, so this is a duplicate of the other one. Um, I just had uh, the fourth one along, so this is the fifth one with the diamonds around it. But I'm painting in those shadows, and of course that was coming out on the previous one, so I needed a new uh, bake for this one. Can you see how much texture space this diamond is taking up? It's almost as much as uh, the top of this uh, chest, which is really frustrating. It's a very detailed diamond, <laughs> very annoying. Is it diamond? It's not, it's a ruby, isn't it? Not a diamond at all, it's red. Uh, so yeah, ruby shape. Uh, it, it's quite fun painting those as well. Again, it's sort of similar to metal, isn't it? But um, uh, you've got to concentrate on the highlights, but much more jaggedy shapes like I've got here. And I just go around, highlight the shapes. Um, I've got a tutorial again on how to paint crystals. Uh, and it's a very similar process with this sort of uh, ruby chest. And it came out fairly well. Again, there's lots more work that can be done. The problem you have with hand painting, you can't paint transparencies. So anything that's glass, um, it has to be um, a sort of, what's it, a colored glass and you can't uh, completely non-see-through. Um, it's, it's very, very awkward to do anything that's slightly see-through. In fact, it just doesn't work with texture painting because as soon as you move around the object, you lose any 
refraction and distortion. Uh, so it just it really just doesn't work. So keep well clear of any um, sort of refractive glasses, uh, anything that's transparent, and where possible, don't include them in your designs. Just uh, think differently about the design. You know, you can see the base of this is a bit awkward because I've copied the base again from the other one, and you can see that sort of dark line there. Uh, it looks really bad. So I created a new model, uh, or separated it, baked it, and then um, now I can edit it without editing the one previously. <laughs> so that baking process is saving me a lot, but it is quite an awkward thing, and it uh, can be a bit glitchy. Now the way you do it is you create a new UV map and then you bake, bake from one UV to another UV uh, map but uh, it's, it's, it's quite a complex thing to explain, uh, even to explain, let alone actually do, quite a, quite a pain. Now you can see I'm adding tiny details in here and uh, again because this is mirrored in the X and Y axis it's really difficult so the only place you can really put it is right on the mirrored edge uh, and then you won't see it on the other side so you have to be a bit careful of those details. I'm not sure they quite work in places. They just about work, but I had to keep them to a minimum. Uh, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's okay, but uh, you have to watch out a bit. So there we go. I think I'm coming to the end um, yes, yeah, so of the process. Just going back over the models a bit, just checking if there's any highlights and things that I need to brush up on. And like I say, um, these are pretty good, uh, close to where I want them to be, but I would have liked to have kept going with them, but there's only so much time and I've got to move on to the next model. Uh, do let me know if there's any comments or anything that you'd like me uh, to go through a bit more uh, and I try and answer those uh, as best I can or include them in the next uh, episode. So thanks for watching, thanks for sticking with me if you're still here and I'll see you next time.